Okay, all right. Well, um, today uh, we will look at um, multivariate sampling. And um, and so kind of this, this section that, uh, that we've been covering has been all about generating uh, samples, random samples that we can use. Because um, as, as our course goes on, we, um, you know, an important idea, important part of kind of these Monte Carlo methods is, uh, is randomness and the ability to generate uh, random samples. And so, um, so we've covered a few uh, methods for generating random samples. Uh, we had the inverse CDF method. We looked at convolutions. We looked at um, uh, rejection sampling. These are all ways for um, creating uh, random samples of values okay, that follow specific distributions. And, uh, and today we'll look at generating uh, random samples if you have some kind of uh, multivariate uh, distribution. Um, we'll uh, also look at uh, this method, uh, the Box-Muller uh, Box -Muller sampler, which allows us to generate values from a uh, random normal distribution. So, um, so right, you know, so, uh, so far, uh, our method for generating values from the random normal distribution is to use the is to use inverse CDF, and and it's technically an approximation. Our inverse CDF method is um, inverse CDF function on the computer is uh, is an approximation to the um, I mean our CDF function for the normal distribution on our computer is a is an approximation to the true CDF. Um, and that's fine, um, but yeah, we will look at doing, um, I guess, the uh, the box Mueller transform uh, in the beginning. Uh, I have to give credit to uh, Professor Tseng. Um His notes were really good; they were better than mine. And so I was like, "Can I just use your notes when I cover these topics?" So, um, so I'm using um, Professor Tseng's notes um, for pretty much this uh, today's entire lecture uh, for the box Mueller sampler, uh, as well as for. Um, uh, We'll look at. I'm just using some of his slides directly when we're going to look at the uh, bivariate normal distribution as well. Okay, so um, Box Mueller transform. This is, uh, I guess, this is an old method uh, dating back to the 50s as far as trying to generate um, some random normal values. Um, ra random normal values. Uh, if you can only generate random uniform values. So if you go, can you go from random uniform to random normal? Um, at this time, when, when this method was developed, we did not have the um, approximation to the uh, normal CDF that, uh, that is currently being used in our systems. And, um, um, and so this method to generate uh, random normal values um, uses this kind of Creative, uh, creative idea to go um, from Cartesian coordinate to uh, polar coordinates. Okay, and so um, so we are going to generate uh, a pair of random uniform values between zero and one, and that pair is uh, you imagine that being plotted in kind of this Cartesian coordinate. So, you know, you generate one random uniform value, and that's going to be your x. You generate another random uniform value, um, and that will be kind of, uh, I guess, uh, well, you, you'll have these two values, okay? Two random uniform values. And what we actually want, is so I shouldn't call those uh, x and y, I'll call those uh, u and v. You'll, we'll generate two random uniform values, u and v, and what we want to do is we want to generate two random normal values, okay? Um, and so our random normal values basically, you know, centered at zero, standard deviation one, two standard normal um, variables. And so we can think about the joint PDF, right? Because uh, if x and y are independent, then you can get the joint PDF just by taking the product of the PDF. So you don't have any kind of like conditional thing 
that you have to include there. So here, um, the PDF of the standard normal is uh, is basically e to the negative x squared over 2, and then we have this normalizing constant of 1 over um, square root 2 pi. Uh, there is a, um, this is an entire, there is a side note. Um, three, 3 blue, 1 brown has a, a video series on where this square root 2 pi comes from um, when you, like, if you try to integrate e to the negative x squared, um, like, how does that generate a square root 2 pi, right? And, uh, and, it's, and it seems almost entirely like, <laughs> um, it's just like one of those weird relationships where, like, e and pi, you know, just somehow show up um, in these in these different locations and stuff. But uh, but anyway, um, fascinating video. Just look up, well, I don't even know what you would call it. Um, well, if I find it, I'll, I'll, I'll post a link, uh, three blue, one brown. But it's like, you know, a series of videos. It's like an hour detour, but, um, but anyway. Um, so anyway, uh, we, we've got this joint PDF, and I'm just gonna take the PDF of a standard normal distribution, and we're gonna have the X for X, standard normal distribution, for y, we'll take the product of these two things. Um, pretty much everything, you know, because it's the same thing twice, they uh, they combine nicely and we get 1 over 2 pi e to the negative x squared plus y squared over 2 right there, okay? Um, we are going to um, convert from our Cartesian coordinate, x, y, into a pair of polar coordinates. We need um, uh, so, you know, basically we say x is r cosine theta, y is r sine theta. I think that's that's pretty familiar to us. And then to kind of convert our PDF, okay, so we'll do our PDF dx dy uh, uh, in x and y. We want the equivalent uh, PDF in r and theta, you know, dr d theta. So, um, so we set, so this is how we're going to... Um, to convert from uh, Cartesian to polar. So it might be a little bit uh, kind of from multivariate calculus, but uh, to do kind of the change of variables, to go from this to kind of isolate our uh, function in r and theta, we'll take our, our function in x, y, and then, you know, we take, we bring you know, divide the uh, by the dr d theta, and so um, so this thing, the dx dy over dr d theta, is kind of um, is is the uh, the Jacobian matrix of basically you know x and y, uh, you know the kind of the the partials of all of these things, um, and and you have like the determinant of this, right? So you have um, you know, dx dr, dx d theta, dy dr, dy d theta, and if you if each of these things are um, r cosine theta and r sine theta, okay, so you know r cosine theta d, dr becomes cosine theta, uh, r sine theta, dr becomes sine theta, and then um, r cosine theta d theta will become negative r sine theta. And then uh, r, r sine theta will become r cosine theta. So you, you kind of take the um, partial derivatives uh, of basically these, these uh, equations uh, with respect to r and theta. And then we have the determinant of this. And so, you know, you get um, r cosine, uh, r, you know, cosine theta squared or, you know, r cosine squared theta plus r sine squared theta, and, um, you know, cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1, so this simplifies to r. So that's, that's kind of a nice little, uh, I guess, identity that works out um, for us. Okay, so, um, so applying that here, um, our function uh, after our PDF when we convert to r theta, uh, r and theta will be our, you know, original kind of PDF of x and y times, um, you know, the 
this whole thing, which is now just R, okay? And then, um, and so if we look back to what, what our PDF was, our PDF um, back here, we can say, oh, well, you know, x squared plus y squared, this quantity right here is equal to r squared. So we can also replace the x squared and y squared with, with r squared here. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is what we have here. Okay, so I have 1 over 2 pi e to the negative r squared over 2 dot times r. Okay, and then, um, and then so finally when we, um, when we do this, we'll get um, uh, uh, throwing back in the, r, the drd theta here. Okay, so, you know, r has to be um, non-negative. Okay, and theta is, uh, is constrained to 0 to 2 pi. And so um, uh, bringing back in r drd theta, okay, um, changing, doing, um, we'll do another uh, kind of change of variables. We'll go from r and theta to r squared and theta. So um, if we uh, do a change of variables, r squared, um, you know, dr squared is going to be 2 r dr. And so we can replace this 2 r dr with 1 half dr squared, okay? So so because we have this r squared value here, um, and so we kind of want it in terms of r squared here. All right, so now um, the joint PDF of this, we are going to do a change of variables from r to, um, to r squared here. And um, okay, so uh, in terms of r, we have e to the negative r squared, um, you know, r dr. Uh, but over here, uh, we can, um, you know, we have e to the negative r squared here, and then we got one half dr squared. So, you know, again, just thinking thinking of this as the uh, you know the variable itself is r squared. And and so we can kind of move things around a little bit. Okay, and here I've got, um, I can separate these out into two factors. All right, I got one half e to the negative r squared over two dr squared. And then uh, over here, I'll have one over two pi d theta. So I'm just kind of moving a couple things around. And, and so now, if we look at this part, oops. Uh, the 1 over 2 pi d theta, this is equivalent to the PDF of a uniform distribution going from 0 to 2 pi, this side over here. Okay, And then, um, you know, we're, we're kind of accustomed to seeing this as just, uh, if I have 1 half e to the negative, just say x over 2 dx, okay, or 1 half e to the negative x over 2, that would be equivalent to an exponential distribution where our rate parameter is one half. Okay, uh, this, this over here. So we have, um, so our kind of our, what do you call it? Our PDF, the joint PDF of R and theta can be factored into basically two independent PDFs. Uh, a PDF for a uniform distribution and a PDF for an exponential distribution where our rate parameter is one half. So this is kind of the, I guess, the ingenuity of the uh, the box Mueller transform is that um, we've gone from an independent x and y now to an independent r and theta. And so, um, so that's what we'll have here, and then we can see that. Uh, you know the variable r squared and the variable theta are independent, and uh, and these are the PDFs to generate each of these things uh, individually. So uh, this is how we would go about um, generating the um, generating normal values using kind of this this transform. So we will generate a random uniform value. Okay, between 0 and 2 pi. So, you know, we, we can generate random uniform values from 0 to 1, and we'll just kind of scale that up to go from 0 to 2 pi to get our theta value. 
and then um, and then we will generate values from the exponential distribution using lambda equal to one half. And so for this, we can do um, inverse CDF method. Okay, so to generate uh, random values from the exponential, we can uh, we can use inverse CDF method. And so and here the v is equal to um, our r squared here. So r squared comes comes from this. And so we're going to generate a v, and we'll say v is equal to r squared, and then we'll just take the square root of whatever value v here gets generated, and then we will go. Um, we will take r cosine theta and r sine theta to get our x and y, and the x will come from a normal standard normal, and y will come from a standard normal. Okay, and then so using inverse CDF method. Um, we can generate um, values from the uh, the exponential here. So we can, um, uh, you know, we got negative uh, one over lambda uh, log log u, okay, is equal to. Um, um, so we'll have that, and then you know, plugging in lambda, we'll get negative two log u, and, and that will come from an exponential distribution here. Okay, so we'll generate a uniform zero one, scale it up by two pi to get a theta value. We'll generate a random uniform value, and then um, inverse CDF to get an exponential, and then we'll take a square root of that to get our r, and then uh, and then we kind of convert r cosine theta, r sine theta to get our x and y. X and y will come from will each come from standard normal. Okay, and so here I have uh, generated, uh, a th we're going to generate a thousand values, and so we'll say give me a thousand uh, random uniform values from zero to one, that will be u, and then we'll just do two times pi t times that u to get our theta. We'll generate um, a thousand random uniform independently from zero to one. This will give me v, and then we kind of use this conversion, uh, inverse CDF, log v, negative two times log v to get our you know, square root. This is gonna give us our r, and then we'll generate r cosine theta and r sine theta, and that will give us an x and a y. And, uh, and we can plot this, okay? And so this is just the plot of two uh, independent normal values. Um, I can show you a few kind of if I copy this, oh, that's weird, um, and go into R and we generate these values, we can see, you know, we can create histograms and we can do kind of a QQ norm and uh, I guess a Kolmogorov Smirnoff test to kind of just check to make sure all of these things indeed are uh, normally distributed. Or again, we can't prove that they're normally distributed, but we can say so far we have no reason to believe that they are not normally distributed. Um, as soon as my R Studio st starts up, I don't know if something's wrong with my computer. Lately, my R Studio has been taking like forever to load. I don't know if you guys are experiencing similar things or if I just need to like clean, do some cleaning up on my own machine here. Don't say that. Don't say that. All right, here, let's try this. Okay. Thousand values. We'll do all of this. Okay. So here is after we do all of this, I can ask, give me a histogram of X. Okay, and that indeed looks like a normal distribution. QQ norm looks normal. Um, oh, actually, well, um, let's see. KS.test, we want X versus P norm. Okay. Um, and then, what's the other? Um, why is my brain not working? Test for no normality, I get it.
Shapiro will test. That's what I want. Okay, and then so we also have, I think it's Shapiro test. So you can do um, the Shapiro test for normality. Um, here, you, your sample size can't be too big, <laughs> between three and 5,000. So if you have too, too big of a sample, the Shapiro test will not work. But you can do a Shapiro test. And so you know all of these things produce p-values greater than 0 0.05, indicating that um, we don't have a reason to believe that it is not normal. That's for x. I can do the same thing for um, for y. So y, we get that. Shapiro test on y, we, we get that. Histogram of y looks like that. QQ norm on y looks like that. So, so everything looks normal. <laughs> so, um, so far, so far, so good. Okay, and then plotting the uh, the pairs of points look like that. Um, let me give you your first view quiz answer, which uh, will be the letter D. Okay, letter D as in dog. So, uh, view quiz one, letter D. Right, week four Wednesday. Yes. Okay. There's a um, there's a neat little uh, visualization on Wikipedia that I think is so cool. Um, and this illustrates how the uh, Box-Muller transform uh, works. So this uh, square right here represents kind of the random values between 0 and 1. So we're generating basically a coordinate within this square uh, from 0 to 1. Okay, And one of these things basically generates uh, you know, we we uh, multiply by 2 pi to give our theta, okay? So you'll notice that as I move um, up and down, the corresponding point goes around in a circle, right? So if I, if I, if I generated 0, our angle 0, and then as I, if I generate, uh, if my uh, value is at, say, like 0.5, then... Um, then my angle is uh, one pi, you know, 180 degrees, and and I kind of go around the circle here. The other uh, coordinate that we generate, the other uh, uniform coordinate, corresponds to um, the radius. Okay, and so if um, our radius is found using um, basically a negative two log v. Okay, so um, at log if v were 1, okay, uh, our radius is going to be 0. And as I go, um, as the radius gets closer to, or as the v gets closer to 0, okay, log v becomes more negative, and our radius becomes longer, okay? So you'll notice that if I stay within kind of one location and kind of slide along here, this corresponds to one particular angle of, uh, of theta. And um, and it generates kind of um, a longer radius, and so you know if I come over here, and uh, it will generate values like this. Uh, you know this is a different angle, and just kind of sliding along horizontally. You know we we generate different values along here, and so you can kind of see like um, basically if you generate values at random within this kind of square from zero to one, zero to one it's going to kind of map to some uh, random location um, in the uh, the entire thing. And uh, the locations that it will map to are, um, you know, have this uh, normal distribution, OK? Kind of like two, two normal distributions here. And so, um, so, you know, so evenly spaced out grid of points here corresponds to kind of, uh, I guess, the equivalent of what what is evenly spaced out in polar coordinates. Okay, so and uh, and overall, um, you know, you can you can take the marginal distribution, and the marginal distribution in each direction will be uh, will be normal as well. So it's kind of a um, I don't know. I think this is really neat. <laughs> um, 
All right. Well, anyway, so that's the uh, the Box Mueller algorithm. Um, it's not how our computer generates random normal values, but um, but it uh, but it works. Okay. So now that we can generate values from random normal zero one, okay, then we can generate values from any normal distribution just kind of by uh, scaling them scaling them up. So if you wanted to generate a new uh, random normal value, say w, that has mean mu and variance sigma squared, okay, um, how can we do that? Well, um, you're going to just generate a standard normal value and then um, w is going to be basically mu plus sigma times uh, your standard normal, okay? Where z comes from, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, yeah. So, z is standard normal, and if you do mu plus sigma times z, the resulting value w will come from a normal distribution with mean mu and sigma squared, right? And so, we can kind of show you that um, the expect expected value of w is equal to mu. The expected value of w will be the expected value of mu plus sigma times z. Um, Sigma in this case is a constant, so that will be just sigma. And then, you know, the only random variable is z, so we're going to get uh, the expected value here is going to be sigma times the expected value of z. And in this case, our expected value of z being standard normal is zero, so the expected value of w is mu, which is exactly what we want. The variance of w will be the variance of mu plus sigma z, okay? And, uh, and here mu is a constant, so there's no variance, so that zeroes out. So now we just have the variance of sigma, um, sigma times z, okay? The variance of z is, uh, is 1, and then, you know, whenever you pull out um, a constant being multiplied by a random variable, you get sigma squared, so we get sigma squared times the variance of z, which is just sigma squared. So, so we get exactly what we want. We get a um, expected value of mu, a variance of sigma squared, and we know this will, you know, kind of will follow a normal distribution there. So we can generate um, values from the normal distribution. All right, um, we can look at, um, now we can kind of keep going and generate um, multivariate samples. And, um, and yeah, so sometimes we'll have some kind of joint distribution, not just the product of two independent values, okay? Because because if your joint distribution is the product of two independent values, you could you could just in generate each value independently, no problem, okay? But sometimes we have a, a joint distribution, and uh, and eventually we will want to generate values from pos potentially very high dimensional distributions, um, and we'll get there eventually. Um, but right now we'll look at say generating something from some kind of joint distribution. Um, we'll start off with a simple case. We'll start off with uh, a discrete distribution. We'll have x and y, and x and y are not uh, independent. And we can see that because, um, you know, um, if they are independent, we would kind of have like the same, um, the probability of being zero or the probability of being one would be the same whether y is zero or y is one, right? So if we, if we condition on y equal to zero, basically we have a two-thirds chance of being zero and a one-third chance of being one. But if we condition on y equal one, we have a six-sevenths chance of being zero and a one-seventh chance of being a one. So, so these are not independent. Um, so how, how would we generate some kind of joint distribution here, okay? Well, um, we basically map from all of these different grids, we, uh, I guess all of the different cells within here, to, um, to something uh, to the scale 0 to 1, right? So we know the sum of all of these um, pairs uh, must add up to 1. So if we say, okay, what is the probability of getting 0, 0? That's 0.2. What's the probability of getting uh, 0 um, or 1, 0? Okay, that's 0.1. And so the probability of getting 0, 0 or uh, 1, 0 is going to be 0 
If I include um, 0, 1, which is 0. 0.6, that jumps up to 0. 0.9, and then the probability of um, the sum of all four will be 1, right? So as we do this, um, we will get this, and then, and so now we're going from 0 to 1, and so I can generate a random uniform value between 0 and 1, and we will say if, it, if you get a value less than 0. 0.2, so the probability of getting a value um, that is less than 0.2 is, uh, is 0.2, and, so, and we will generate 0, 0. So the probability of generating 0, 0 is 0 0.2. And then we're going to say, okay, if we get a value between 0.2 and 0.3, which has a probability of 0.1, then we will generate the, point, um, the coordinate 1, 0. Okay, so this has a probability of 0.1. That's probably being between 0.2 and 0.3. Okay, the probability of being between 0.3 and 0.9 is 0.6. And, that's, uh, and if we do end up between 0.3 and 0.9, we will generate 0, 1. And then if we and generate anything greater than 0.9, we will, um, and obviously less than 1, we will um, generate the point 1, 1. Okay? And so this will map, this maps all of our different combinations of x and y onto a, a number line between 0 and 1. Um, okay, so I think that's simple enough, and this can be generalized to any pair of discrete distribution, dis discrete variables, or uh, some any kind of bivariate discrete distribution. So here um, we're going to say x can be the values 1, 2, 3, 4, and y can be the values 1, 2, 3, 4, and the only requirement is that the sum of all of these things add up to 1, and I, I think I went through the trouble and I made sure it does. And, um, and so now we have 16 values to, um, to sum, and the sum of all 16 adds up to 1, and basically this creates, will create you know, 16 little partitions, uh, or 16 different kind of zones on, um, on the number line from 0 to 1. And anytime you end up in one of these uh, little segments, you will generate kind of the corresponding pair. So if you generate a random u less than 0.02, which has probability 0.02, you'll generate the 0.11. If you generate something between 0.02 and 0.05, and there's a probability of 0.03 of that happening, you'll generate the 0.2,1, and so on and so forth. Um, how would you write something like this in code? Okay, well, um, uh, that's, uh, I'll, I'll show you that. So again, this kind of just explains how, how this all works. Um, and so here, here's my matrix of all of the values, I think. I think this is correct, so 0 0.02, 0 0.06, 0 0.03, 0 0.05. So, um, so I just kind of put in you know, our 4x4 four four, uh, matrix of points, um, and if, if you want it to, uh, to go into R like this, you, you specify by tr by row equals true, all right? And then we will take our matrix and make it a vector, just so that it becomes basically a vector of 16 values. And then I will um, run a cumulative sum, which is basically, um, you know, the uh, exactly what we have here, right? So, so all of these values right here are F1, F1, F2, F3, F4, all the way up to F16. Um, is the cumulative sum, right? Cumulative sum of 2, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 0 0.04, so on and so forth. So we have 0 0.02, 0 0.05, 0 0.09. So these are my cumulative probabilities. After 16 values, we, we end up at 1. And then, um, and then I'm going to create two vectors, OK? I'm going to create kind of what, um, what everything corresponds to. So. Um, 0.02 corresponds to basically um, 1 comma 1, and then if we're between uh, 02 and 05, we will generate 2 comma 1, so on and so forth. So I'm going to repeat the values 1 through 4, four times, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, so on and so forth. And then for the y values, um, we will repeat um, 1, 1 through 4, but each of those four times. So we get 1, 1, 1, 1. 2, 2, 2, 2, 3, 3, 3, 3, 
4444. So this has all 16 possible combinations along with their corresponding cumulative probability. And I have uh, row binded them all into basically this one matrix here. All right, so now um, to do this, I'm going to just generate some random uniform value here. I'm going to just pretend the u that I generated is 0.01. And I'm going to ask uh, um, which u is less than our cumulative probability. Okay, and we're going to kind of, uh, um, um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. Where is um, the cumulative probability greater than u? Okay, where is the cumulative probability greater than u? So actually, all of these, all of the cumulative probabilities are greater than 0.01. And which one is the smallest? Well, in this case, the first column, 0.02, is greater than 0.01. So we're going to go to position 1, and then the kind of the random x value corresponding to position 1 will be 1 and 1. And then if I um, say generate 0.03, if my random value that I generate is 0.03, I say uh, um, which u's are, uh, or which cumulative probabilities are greater than u, okay? And it's going to say starting at, um, you know, the second cumulative probability at 0.05, that one is greater, and we're going to ask, all of these things are going to be true over here, um, and we want the smallest one. So we're going to go to the second position, and that's going to correspond to 2 comma 1, okay? Um, and just kind of, you know, one more example here. Uh, if I generate 0.89, okay, if my random u that I generated is 0.89, we're going to ask, okay, uh, which values have the cumulative probability greater than 0.89? And that's going to, I don't know why this is highlighting funny, um, correspond to just these two values, 0 0.09, 0 0.9, and 1 have cumulative probabilities greater than 0.89, and the, the smallest one is 15, and 15 corresponds to a 3 and a 4. And so we can do that. I can um, kind of just ask uh, which one, <laughs> uh, what's the minimum of this, and that will generate my position. So I'm going to generate, you know, 10,000 of these values. We're going to apply this position function um, to all of these 10,000 values, and then we will um, get out those positions, and then all of the x values will be my positions, all of my y values will be those positions. And we can kind of join them together into a data frame. And if I wanted to plot this, this is going to be the, uh, the data frame that I generate. And, um, and so here we can see uh, this is uh, the most probable with a, you know, our joint probability is um, point, uh, point oh 0.01 here. But you know what? I think I need to transpose. All right. Okay, so this is my x and this is my y. So uh, it, it'll, it'll look a little bit funny because the x is on the x-axis and y is on the vertical axis, whereas um, over here, x is uh, in the rows and y is in the columns. So um, you can look at, so you have to mentally kind of flip. And so where x is 3 and y is 2, that has probability 0.2. And then um, when y is 4 and x is 3 and x is 4 and y is 4, we get probability 0.1. So looking at this, this is when x is 3 and y is 2. All of these have probabilities 0.1. So anyway, it, this corresponds to this. It's just the transpose I should have uh, mapped my AES coordinates a little bit differently. But anyway, um, that's what we have. OK. Um, so that is uh, just by very discrete values. And then let me go ahead and give you your second view quiz answer. Today's um, is uh, B, B as in bear. Second uh, view quiz answer is B. Okay, and then um, for the last bit, I'm going to just use Professor Tsang's notes <laughs> directly for uh, the bivariate normal distribution. So these are um, Professor Tsang's uh, lecture notes. Um, okay, so 
So we've seen a generating just a standard normal, uh, a pair of standard normal um, values, uh, in, but th those were independent. Um, we looked at generating, say, like discrete um, bivariate distribution. And so uh, another thing that we might um, want to generate would be like kind of a bivariate normal distribution. And the bivariate normal distribution, you have these, uh, you'll generate kind of a pair of, say, a uh, pair of um, random variables, x1 and x2. And you can ask, you know, what is the mean of x1? And the mean of x1 is mu1. What is the mean of x2? And the mean of x2 is mu2. Um, so you can look at each variable independently. And you can say, okay, and what is the variance of x1? And the variance of x1 will be sigma1 squared. And what's the variance of x2? And that will be sigma2 squared. But you might also have covariance. You might have covariance between x1 and x2. So if you think about something like um, someone's height and someone's arm span, okay? So we might say height is normally distributed, okay? Uh, you got a lot of people who are average height, some people are taller, some people are, who are shorter, and height will be a pro, uh, about normally distributed. You can also do arm span. Arm span will also be um, normally distributed. You're going to have some people who have long arms, some people have short arms. And you're going to have, um, but you also have high correlation between height and arm span, okay? Or, or similarly, there's also like uh, standing height and sitting height, okay? And I don't know if you've ever, um, this is like a silly game to play at your next, um, next time you're hanging out with friends. Um, everyone's sitting on the couch and you look at their heights and then you say, okay, well, let's guess who's tallest or shortest when they, everybody stands up. And, you know, there's, there's correlation between um, sitting height and standing height, but there's also kind of like, uh, there's a difference, right? So in general, taller people, when they sit down, will also be taller. Shorter people, when they sit down, will be shorter. But sometimes uh, somebody will sit down and be, um, you know, kind of short. But then when they stand, they really, they're really tall or whatever. Okay. But, you know, and or arms, you know, height and arm span, again, uh, correlated. But sometimes you have tall people with shorter arms. Some people, times you have uh, shorter people with long arms and things like that. So we want to be able to show some kind of covariance here. Um, let me just show, look up multivariate normal distribution. And, uh, and this is our diagram from Wikipedia. And it might look something like this, where you have uh, you know, a covariance between kind of your two normal distributions. When you take the marginal distribution of, say, x, you know, you have a normal distribution. You take the marginal distribution of y, uh, you also get a normal distribution. And But the uh, there's um, correlation or covariance between x and y. Um, you know, kind of basically you get like an ellipse of, um, let me look at this. So, so here's kind of another another plot, um, you know, you have your x, you have your y, but then you have um, covariance between them. And so, you know, how can we generate um, generate a pair of points so that there's covariance between them, you know, and, uh, and we want to be able to specify this covariance exactly. Um, so we want to say, you know, sigma 1, 2 is going to be the covariance between x1 and x2, and, you know, the definition of covariance is the expected value of this product of x1 minus mu1 times x, x2 minus mu2. Okay, so this is, um, this is what we want. We want to generate um, this pair of points, x1 and x2. And, uh, and the way we're going to, um, to do this is we want to think of some kind of... Um, some kind of matrix, okay? And we're going to define, um, uh, you know, y as as the product of this two by two matrix times x one and x two, and uh, 
And so when we do this, all right, uh, and we ask, okay, well, what is, um, so y is also going to be a pair of points, right? So you do a 2 by 2 times this, this um, pair of points x1 and x2, you're going to get, um, you know, two, uh, two y values and, and so on and so forth. So you can ask, okay, what is the mean of this, all right, the, um, the expected value of y you can find by taking the product of a times um, the, your, uh, your mu vector, okay? And then, um, and if you ask, okay, what does our sigma matrix look like, all right? That's going to be um, A times our sigma matrix times A transpose. So it's kind of like when you multiply by in univariate, um, for univariate random variable, when you multiply by a constant, the uh, resulting variable is going to be like the constant squared times um, the variance, okay? And similarly, when you multiply a multivariate um, random variable by uh, a, a matrix, it's going to basically be, you know, kind of like the thing squared, but in matrix form you get A, you know, sigma, A transpose here. So um, what we want to do is we want to go from standard, uni uh, standard normal variables, okay, with mean zero and uh, variance one, to basically the uh, the pair of points that that we desire with mean mu and variance um, sigma squared. <clears throat> so um, so we'll start off by generating uh, a pair of standard uniform values or standard normal values. Sorry, standard normal values. So we're going to say z1 and z2 are independently uh, generated from the standard normal, okay? So z1 has mean zero, z2 has mean zero, and uh, the variance of z1, z2, the joint distribution, because they are standard normal, standard normal and there's no, uh, they are independent, our variance matrix is basically the identity matrix here. And so, um, so in this case, um, to get what we want, we're going to say x is we're going, you know, we, we need to figure out some vector b and some matrix a so that um, the resulting uh, variable um, x, which is going to be kind of, um, you know, we find some vector b plus some matrix a times z, we want that to be the, have the properties that we want. We want um, the mean to be mu sub x, and we want uh, the variance after multiplying kind of our pair of independent normal um, to, to be this uh, bivariate normal thing, okay? So again, we're just kind of looking for some kind of two by two matrix here so that the result will, will fill the criteria that we want. So, um, so what value of B and what matrix A should we use to, to give us the, uh, the thing that we want, okay? So we can say, well, if we define um, B equal to some matrix A times Z, um, we can say, all right, well, the expected value of X, the mean of X is going to be the expected value of X. X is, uh, you know, B plus this. Um, and so we're going to get B there's no random variable in B, so that will just be a constant that we can pull out. And then we'll just get the, you know, what is the expected value of our matrix A times our random variable Z. Um, and we can pull the, um, the matrix A out, and that will be um, A times the expected value of random variable Z. Well, we know random variable Z is, um, is zero, okay? It's just, uh, we've got two standard normal um, values, and so the expected value of x is just going to be b. And so if we want um, uh, if we want the uh, expected value of x to be uh, mu sub x, then we, we should set, um, I mean, sorry, if we want it to equal to mu, then we're going to set b equal to mu. So, so that's simple enough, right? So we want to set b equal to mu, and that will generate, um, uh, when we apply this transformation, 
the resulting x variable will have have this mean. So I think that makes sense. Okay, so we're just gonna we have kind of our cloud of <laughs> standard normal points centered at zero, uh, standard deviation or variance one in each direction, and we're just gonna kind of shift that up to wherever um, our new new center is. The covariance matrix of our random variable x, okay, uh, can be found this way. So we want to say, okay, what is what is this um, you know covariance matrix of our random variable x? So we're going to say, okay, well x is defined as our uh, vector b plus our matrix a times our random variable z, z being the uh, pair of standard normal. Um, B is a constant here, so there's no covariance there, so that zeroes out. So we just need to figure out, okay, what is the covariance of matrix A times a random variable Z? So again, anytime you have um, a matrix multiplied by Z and you want to kind of pull it out of the covariance, you're going to get A times the uh, covariance times A transpose. And earlier we defined, um, you know, Z as kind of this pair of independent standard normal um, variables, and so the covariance of z is going to be our identity matrix, okay, one, um, the identity matrix here. So um, the covariance of our random variable x is going to be um, basically a times the identity times a transpose, and so our covariance of x is going to be a a transpose, a a transpose. So this gives us a, a clue as far as what sh we should set A equal to, okay? We want to find some matrix A, right? So our desired covariance, we want the, um, the resulting covariance of our X variable to equal um, whatever sigma matrix that we have here, right? So in our case, we want to choose an A matrix so that AA transpose is equal to the desired sigma matrix. All right, so um, what is this decomposition here? Okay, so we want to have, so basically we're looking for some matrix A so that AA transpose is equal to our um, matrix sigma. And so, um, so I don't know if we remember this from linear algebra. Um, if you have a positive definite matrix sigma, which uh, will be the case for basically any um, covariance matrix, so any all covariance matrices are uh, positive definite. I, um, well, I, I guess maybe positive semi-definite, but as long as you end, end up with a positive definite thing, okay, we can find a, um, a lower triangular matrix A, all right, and this will be our Ko Koleski decomposition. So we want to find sigma is equal to AA transpose. Some A so that AA transpose is equal to our target um, sigma, right? So we want to find a triangular matrix, lower triangular matrix. So we'll leave a zero in this corner, and, uh, and we've got values T1, T11, T21, T22, so that AA transpose is going to equal um, our target uh, covariance matrix with variance uh, sigma 1 squared, covariance sigma 1, 2, and sigma 2 squared, variance sigma 2 squared. Okay, so um, if I do AA transpose, a is going to be uh, this, A transpose is this, and so the product of A, A transpose is, um, you know, we got T11 squared, uh, T11, T21, and then the last one is uh, T21 squared plus T22 squared. And we have this equal to this. So now I have, um, I've got a system of three equations and three unknowns, all right? So uh, I think the first one, uh, and I didn't, um, I don't have this all written out, but I have 
you know, T11 squared is equal to sigma1 squared. That one's the easiest one. So we could say, okay, T11 is going to be the square root of uh, sigma1 squared, okay? And then um, I have T11, T21 is equal to sigma12. And so I could say T21 is equal to sigma12 divided by T11. Maybe, maybe I should have written this out. Um, and uh, and we, we just established that T11 is uh, sigma1, so we can just do um, sigma12 divided by sigma1 here. Okay, and then so the last one over here, we have uh, T21 squared plus T22 squared is equal to sigma2 squared. And so I can kind of isolate it to T T22 squared. T22 squared will be sigma2 squared minus T21 squared. Okay, so um, ignoring the square root for now, I would have T22 squared equal to sigma2 squared minus T21 squared. And then just in the previous step, we established that um, T21 is sigma12 over sigma1. All right, so T21 squared is going to be sigma12 over sigma1 quantity squared. And then if we want to get um, t isolate T22 by itself, we will take the square root of everything. All right, is that okay? All of these, all three of these things. So, you know, we just kind of work through our, um, you know, we have three equations and three unknowns, um, and we can all kind of do substitution to, uh, to figure out each of these things. So, you know, it's a, it's a tiny bit messy, but now I have uh, an answer for what T11 should be, T21, and T22, what those values should be. So, um, so using this, this will be our, um, the values that we use for our A matrix. Um, all right, so um, we can say that you know, we have some vector mu, okay, which consists of basically just any, any two values in real space, okay. Um, our covariance matrix has to be a symmetric positive definite two by two matrix, no problem, okay. And we're going to say we're going to generate uh, z, a vector of standard normal values, a pair of standard normal values independent, and then we will take, um, we will set x equal to mu plus a times z, all right? And mu is our the desired uh, desired vector of mu one and mu two. Our a we established to be these three values, t one one, t two one, and t two two. And we can see that when we do a a transpose, um, we will get our sigma matrix. Okay, so we're going to do this times our um, pair of z1, z2, right? And we can say that this, uh, this vector x will come from a normal distribution with mean uh, mu, mu and uh, covariance uh, sigma, okay? And sigma is gonna be equal to AA transpose. Okay, so this is, um, this is how we will do it. So just kind of laying this out, we are able to generate values from standard normal We'll compute the um, Koleski decomposition using uh, of sigma, uh, and we'll find a, you know AA transpose, and then um, and then we just say mu plus a times z, and that will generate x. Okay, and this also um, will generate uh, generalize to basically any. Um, any dimensional uh, multivariate normal distribution for any dimension d, which is which is pretty neat. Okay, so you just have to kind of find some lower triangular decomposition of your. You know, you might have a sigma matrix, a three by three sigma matrix, or a five by five sigma matrix, if if you want them all to be kind of this this uh, multivariate uh, normal distribution. Okay, so um, let's uh, let's do this. 
So we could we could do our um, um, what do you call it um, decomposition ourselves. We can also use ours. Am I not able to select? Boo. Okay. <laughs> all right. Let me. Um, all right. So let's say this is our our target distribution. So I'm going to generate a thousand of these points, and then we're going to say um, the target mean that we want. We want a mean of one comma two. And we're going to generate a sigma matrix. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate um, a bunch of z values. Okay, so we're going to generate um, 2,000 random normal values, and I'm going to put them into a matrix. Of uh, we want um, two rows here. So our Z in here. Oh, that's all. No problem. Okay, and then so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take. Um, we can do the Kolesky decomposition of sigma, and we get uh, we get this. Um, if I set this equal to A, we can do A times A transpose. Uh, why did this not work? I need uh, Koleski gives me the upper triangle. Okay, so if I do A, A transpose, okay, so um, the Koleski, I guess the Koleski decomposition here will return it gives us, the, uh, yeah, upper triangular. Okay, so this will be um, basically A transpose A will give us X um, but we want AA transpose. I mean, same kind of idea here. Uh, and we can see, you know, if I if I do this and I need to get AA transpose, we get back the um, the desired uh, matrix of you know 1.7.71. Okay, so uh, we're going to set x equal to um, we want to do uh, mu plus a times z, right? So we're going to do uh, mu plus a times our z matrix. So now for x, I have um, two rows, a thousand columns. Um, I can tr transpose x, and I can just kind of plot the transpose of x. And we can see this. This is our kind of our bivariate normal. Let me Uh, how, do I, how do I set this? Uh, CEX equals 0.4. All right, smaller, smaller data points here. All right, um, and um, and so if I take uh, one of these rows of X, we can do a couple um, tests. So here's a here's a vector. So we'll, I'll call this X1, and we can just say, all right, give me a histogram of X1. And that indeed looks like the normal distribution. We can kind of um, test a couple things. We can say, all right, what is the mean of x1? 
the mean of x1 is 1.02, um, which is close to our desired mu. Uh, I can ask what is the, uh, the variance of, uh, of x1. And we want uh, something around 1. All right. Um, I can pull out, extract out the second row to give us x2. All right, and we can ask, what is the mean of x2? Uh, and we get something uh, around 2, our desired mu. And I can ask, what is the variance of x2? And we get something similar to 1. And what we also want to see is, what is the covariance between x1 and x2? Okay, and we get something close to um, our target covariance of 0.7. So, so this, this is all a good sign. I can ask, what is the histogram of x2? I could do Shapiro test x1. We want to see something that is no evidence of a significant difference between uh, the normal distribution what we have. OK, we're at 0 0.06, so, so we're, um, we're still in the OK. Um, x2 is, uh, I guess, you know, seemingly more uh, normal here. Yeah, um, for whatever reason, when we do QQ norm on X1, there is a little bit of kind of, um, yeah, looking at the histogram of X1, you can see, yeah, a little bit of a, uh, we're getting some values um, a little bit kind of far in the tail over here. All right, um, QQ norm on X2, we get, um, that, lo that looks better here. Okay. So that, um, that's what we get. Um, and it can be, um, you know, you can have a, a different kind of uh, thing. You can increase our, um, the variance of y to say before, and then maybe you want your covariance to be um, something like 2 here. OK, same kind of thing here. Um, That's, that's, sorry. Okay, so this is our pair of independent standard normal. And then what we want to do is we want to do mu plus a times z. And, uh, and we'll get something that looks kind of like this, right? Um, oh. Actually, this is this is the old thing. I actually have to do a is equal to transpose of the Koleski decomposition of sigma. I left out a lot of these. Um, okay, so apparently this is not a valid covariance matrix here. This is going to work. Error and collect the leading minor of order two is not positive. All right, what did I do? Did it break something? Okay, you can't just. You can't just pick arbitrary numbers. How do I get covariance between these things? OK. All right, well, this, this will give us something. <laughs> All right, so that, I guess this works as far as, uh, um, you know, getting different variances or something. Um, yeah, I guess you can't just pick arbitrary numbers to be your covariance value between uh, x1 and x2 or x and y here. But OK, well, anyway, um, this is how we can generate uh, some bivariate normal values. Um, I've posted your next homework assignment as well. I know um, they just kind of keep coming. Um, but you can, you, can start, you can get started on uh, homework three if you so desire. 
Um, but I know you guys are uh, still kind of, um, you guys just finished uh, homework two and whatnot. But, uh, but anyway, the, the next thing is up in, uh, in week five here. All right, we will um, we'll wrap it up here. We'll call it a day, and we will see you uh, next week. All right, and then um, so next week, so we've moved the midterm exam to week six. So I'll, I'll cover what topics you can expect uh, next week in the midterm. Okay, all right. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you see you Monday.